Hi, my name is Melissa Jebrin, and I'm the state representative for the 34th District, which has East Hampton, East Haddam, and a part of Colchester. And we're here today for a small mental health roundtable to bring information and answer some questions that our constituents might have about how to access mental health in their community. And we're here in Colchester today, and I'm with the first selectman of Colchester, Greg Schuster. And Greg, thanks so much for hosting us. Can you tell us a little bit about where we are? Absolutely. We're in Craig Memorial Library here in Colchester, Connecticut. Uh, you're in the Norton Room, and it's a perfect setting for us to have this discussion. I want to thank you for hosting this and thank all the panelists for coming here today. Great. Thanks so much. At this time, maybe you guys could introduce yourselves. Sure. Um, I'm Christy Barber, and I'm the Executive Director for the Region 2 Regional Mental Health Board, which is the South Central Region of Connecticut, and it includes Colchester, East Hampton, and East Haddam. Great. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Ann Nelson, and I am the Family uh, Research and Provider Education Coordinator for NAMI Connecticut, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Connecticut. Um, and I'm also a parent of a 19-year-old uh, who has lived with mental illness since she's about four, so I bring that personal piece to the table. Great. Thanks so much. I'm Jen Fiescanero. I'm a school psychologist in East Hampton, Connecticut at Memorial Elementary School, which services preschool to third grade. Yeah, hi, I'm Thomas Burr. I'm the Communications Manager for NAMI Connecticut, which is again the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the Connecticut chapter. We're an organization that provides support, education, and advocacy. Great. Again, thanks to everyone for, for coming, and um, you know, I guess we'll get right down to it. There's a lot of questions that my constituents have about mental health. They're, uh, you know, they hesitate to talking about it. There's that stigma attached, which is, which is the purpose of why we're here, to help people understand their resources and the privacy of their own home by watching a quick tape on where they can go for some of that help. So Tom, I'm going to uh, ask you if you could just tell us about NAMI, uh, what the organization is. And, and, who, and who it serves. All right. Um, NAMI, again, is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, we're a national organization headquartered in the Washington, D.C. area. There's a state chapter in all the 50 states here in Connecticut. We're located up in Hartford. And when, within any given state, there are some number of affiliates. Here in Connecticut, we have 13 local affiliates that are spread throughout the state. Our primary purpose is to provide support, education, and advocacy for both people living with mental illness as well as their family members and friends. Mm -hmm. And we also do uh, provider education for both mental health professionals, first responders, and any other interested organizations that want to learn more about mental health and mental illness. Oh, great. Um, so in uh, my district, which is East Hampton, East Haddam, and a part of Colchester, what is that one of those 13 regions that oversees my area? We were looking on the map earlier, and probably the closest affiliate would be NAMI Southeast, which is uh, out of Norwich. I so see. there's nothing right here in your district, but that's probably the closest okay. one. And at the end of this video, we're going to have all that contact information, so thank you very much. Um, Christy, maybe you could tell me how a person knows where to begin asking for help and, um, you know, kind of how that starts at the basic level for somebody who, you know, says, geez, I, I really need to get my family members some help or I think I might need some help. How does that start? I think that that's, um, that's a great question because it, it's in a, it depends on the, the, the varying level of if somebody's in crisis versus if somebody is just kind of knowing that something's not quite right. Mm -hmm. um, I actually would say that 211 is a great resource. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, they, they will farm you out to where they think might be best. Mm -hmm. um, it also depends how if you have insurance or if you don't have insurance. Okay. And I think that um, that there are varying levels of, of uh, help based on that. Mm -hmm. So if you, um, if you have insurance, you know, I think that looking at to one, even looking at some of the state funded um, resources to, to get an, an idea of do, what type of counseling, um, what other types of services I might need. Mm -hmm. um, if you um, don't have a high level of insurance, there are state operated um, services. River Valley Services is here that serves um, this, this area. Where are they located? Okay. River they're, Valley. they're located in, in Middletown. Okay on the campus of Connecticut Valley Hospital, so CVH. Okay. Um, and then there are also different types of supports 
mm -hmm. also affiliated with that. But you're saying the first step is to is is somebody dialing two one one. I would say two one one. I would say NAMI is also a good resource. Mm -hmm. You know, looking up uh, the their website, um, the regional boards. That's also a part of what we can do is try to help you know people navigate. That's one of the challenges I think when people first look mm -hmm. is navigation of the system. Okay. Um, and Tom, can you explain maybe some of the most effective programs that NAMI uh, offers? Certainly. Um, in the support arena, we offer three different types of support groups. There's the NAMI Connection Support Group, which is intended for individuals living with mental illness, and it's run by people in recovery from a mental illness. They're trained uh, by us, so they're really effective at what they do. We also have a family and friends support group which is intended for family members or friends of someone again living with a mental illness again uh, facilitated by people who are trained to be support group facilitators that's in fact that's one of the things that I do as a volunteer um, lastly there's a child and adolescent network support group which is intended for uh, parents of school-aged children uh, another really effective program, we do a whole slew of different educational programs, I'll just mention one because we want to be brief, and that's the Family to Family program. That meets one night a week for 12 weeks for about two hours or so, and it is a true evidence-based program. In other words, it's been studied and researched, and it's been verified that it's a very effective program. And in fact, when I talk about NAMI at different civic organizations and different places where I go, I often will tell folks that if we did nothing else, but offer that one class, we would be a great organization because it truly is transformative. It really helps people out a lot. Well, maybe you could help me understand. So it's called Family to Family. Yep. And how does, ex yeah, real, explain real the briefly. genesis. Yeah, because I'm very interested. Yeah, um, um, it covers all the different types of mental illnesses, you know, what they're about, the symptoms and, and all that. It talks about medications, the different types of medications, what they do, side effects of the medications. Okay. Um, but most importantly, and this is what I found really helpful back when I was in crisis with my family, um, was coping skills. How do you cope when you have a family member who is exhibiting symptomologies from a serious mental illness and your whole world has been turned upside down? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with someone who's not tracking in the here and now, who may be having uh, hallucinations or delusions? You know, how, how do you deal with that? I see. And without losing your own mind in the process. Yeah, so yes, yeah. it, it was wonderful. I tell people all the time, I can't prove that it helped save my family member's life, but it certainly saved my marriage because my wife and I, and this is very common with people I with see. a mental health crisis, we're just coming at it from two different places and it, a lot of times if people don't get the help that's out there yeah. uh, that will break a family apart it's really. awful. so the family to family program is uh, is it one-on-one -on -one? Mm -hmm. is it kind of a group of it's, people it's that group. come together like a like a support uh, uh, it's meeting? not really a support group it's a, it's a standardized okay. class and there's a big binder that you get um, okay. which and typically they don't charge for this it's free oh okay. if they charge anything it's maybe 20 bucks to cover the cost of the materials but most of the affiliates that host these it's free um, but it's uh, classroom setting, usually anywhere from a dozen to two dozen people. They don't want to have them too big. Um, I forget what the minimum is, maybe half a dozen before they won't hold it. But, yeah. I see. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks so much. It's, you know, one of the reasons we're here really is to learn about these resources that are available in our community and, and get the word out. So it like, sounds like a great program. It is. Um, and can you um, tell us how people can become better educated and avoid the common myths, myths surrounding mental illness? And maybe Tom mentioned recovery. What, right. is that, what does that mean exactly? Well. The word recovery um, is a word that's utilized to reveal that someone with mental illness is not a death sentence, mm -hmm. that there is hope um, for wellness. And the st statistics show that actually when someone with mental illness does receive the treatment that is needed, there's about a 70 to 90 percent chance of recovery, mm -hmm. which is even better than if someone had a heart attack. So recovery is a model of looking at mental illness within the framework of wellness, mm -hmm. so that we're trying to have folks who have a mental illness receive um, not just the medications, not just sort of the medical model, but that we have to look at other things like supports, um, friends, um, faith, uh, productivity, you know, ensuring that someone with mental illness has all the hopes and dreams that all of us have. Mm -hmm. um, 
So um, are you finding that nowadays the kind of the first place to start for that is the internet or two on one or when when somebody wants to just find those res you know those those resources is that what do you suggest well, that they do? You know do? what I'll have to be honest I think you had mentioned it when we were talking earlier is when I'm a family member and my daughter first was diagnosed or first had has some symptoms when she was quite young, I had no clue where to go. And I think that's sort of part of why we're here. Absolutely. Um, I had no idea and I felt like the worst mother because I couldn't find anyone else who understood it. So I think um, NAMI um, and there's other organizations, I think one of our key um, roles is to really make ourselves known mm -hmm. in the community, market ourselves, because it wasn't until my daughter was hospitalized at age eight um, that I met another family member who wow. lived with the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it, we need to come together on a community basis so that we don't feel so alone. Mm -hmm. well, that's a very good point. Um, uh, Jen, maybe you can tell us in East Hampton, you know, I know, I know you're seeing a specialized, uh, you know, age group of kids, but you must know of other resources throughout uh, the town. If you could talk to us about, in East Hampton specifically, what somebody can do. Definitely. I think that it's important not to underestimate how many resources are available just within the school system. Um, each one of our schools in East Hampton has a full-time school psychologist in every building. We also have social work support staff, counseling support staff, and we have worked together to compile a list of resources of just local facilities and organizations in the area mm -hmm. to provide to families if they ever have a question or a concern or something that they're looking for. Um, it's a wide breadth of organizations that we've worked with in the past, that families have worked with in the past, that just may give parents just a better idea of where to go and where to start looking. So um, I would um, hopefully, and my assumption would be that that's just not in East Hampton, but that's available in Colchester uh, School System and East Haddam. So maybe you could explain to me there's a parent that has has, um, maybe it's not their child, maybe it's their grandmother or their aunt, their uncle, they have some concerns. Can they call um, right um, to the school uh, themselves, ask for the school psychologist Absolutely. and have that confidential uh, discussion to help get those resources? Absolutely. Um, we are all available five days a week. I'm at my school five days a week and I always encourage parents to call, even with the smallest question. Mm -hmm. It may be something that seems silly to you, but it just keeps nagging and gnawing at you and it's a concern that you have. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage parents of all students to contact us anytime, even mm -hmm. if it's just for a question or I have this concern can I bounce it off of you? Can I get your opinion on this? Where should I look? Should I go to my pediatrician? Should I start there? I just, I need somebody else to listen and kind of help me sort through this problem. Mm -hmm. um, we encourage parents to call all the time. Our voicemails are confidential. Um, you can call the school's main office and always just ask to speak to the social worker, psychologist, um, and you'll be put right through. Wow, that's great. Um, so in East Hampton, is there also like a youth and family services organization that maybe kind of takes up the family aspect of, we, of the issue? We do. We have a wonderful youth and family services organization in town that the schools work with very closely and that parents and families have utilized in the past as well. Mm. I know in my, in my hometown, and I'm kind of stuck between East Hampton and East Haddam, depending on uh, who you ask who my, what my hometown is, but um, in East Haddam we have a very active youth and family services organization and they have some uh, a new program called the Local Prevention Council and it talks about assets in the community, mm. meaning, you know, like you had mentioned, you know, it could be a religious organization, it could be something else, but those assets, how it creates a community of resources for uh, a family. So we have that in East Haddam, but maybe, uh, Greg, you can talk about uh, Colchester and, and what Colchester offers. <coughs> Colchester has very similar options uh, for families. Um, we, I do want to talk a little bit about emergency services for a second, mm. though. Um, there, yeah. th we do have incidents all the time um, where people are threatening to harm themselves, and it's a, the worst manifestation, I guess you can see, of, of mental illness. Like what you talked about, crisis. It, yeah, that's it, right. When it reaches a crisis point, and no one ever wants to call 911 on a family member. It's probably one of the worst mm -hmm. decisions you could ever make in your life, uh, but I would urge everyone to really go ahead and make that call. We are here to help. We have police who are trained, um, firefighter EMTs that are trained. They will come help assist the situa assess the situation and get the person to the, the facility that best meets their needs. And from there, you can really start talking about the options uh, that you have available to you. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that we have available at the, the, the Colchester and a lot of other towns is a prescription drug take-back program. 
why is that important? I'm well, so, I'm so well. I just say I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm so glad that you brought this up because um, I was sit on the environment committee along with the appropriations and public health. Uh, we were at Wesleyan last night for a very long public hearing, but on the environment committee, uh, we've been talking about uh, mandating a place for prescription uh, drug take back, not mm. just because of a mental health issue, but because of an environment issue when that gets into drinking water. So I'm so thankful you brought that up. Could you? You talk about that and uh, specifically I'd like to know too is it just for Colchester residents so if you could talk about that that would be great so first the prescription take back is located in the Colchester police office anyone can walk in there from any town and go ahead and deposit uh, their prescription drugs uh, we don't ask for ID or anything like that it's completely anonymous so we encourage everyone to go ahead and do that and, and the importance of this is to get these drugs out of the house Oftentimes, mm -hmm. children's first exposure um, to drugs that they shouldn't be having is through prescription drugs, and it's a gateway to other drugs. Uh, so whether it be abuse of prescription drugs or abuse of illegal drugs, we know that this can lead to mental illness. So I think stopping that process right at the very beginning uh, is crucial, and hopefully everyone can go through your house, take off those, uh, those extra painkillers that have been mm -hmm. sitting around for a couple of years, and let's get them out of the house and let's stop this uh, from being a problem. Mm. So um, the Colchester Police, uh, what are the hours? Like, so is it is it any time or is it in, it's located inside the office? So is it eight to four, what are the hours? Uh, typically 8.30 to 4.30. Okay. There are police on staff there at other times. However, the office could be locked okay. um, if they're out on a call. Okay, uh, but during, during the day, to weekday, 8.30 to 4.30, just knock on the door, go right in the foyer, and uh, you'll see the box right there. Great, mm. well, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to go back to you and talk about the crisis, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, situation that Greg alluded to with the having to dial 911. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted to pull us together is I had had a conversation with the first selectman and found out that there was a high incidence, um, unfortunately, in the last quarter of those kinds of calls and attempted suicide. So you had talked about the health you know, right now, just somebody says, oh, I, I think I have a problem, and then the crisis situation. So mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit more about that crisis situation so families know, um, besides 911, what are some other options, if, if there are any, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and what, you know, what, what should they do? One of the things that DCF did um, to, a couple of years ago was to change all of their crisis lines to 211, because each, like, individual, um, agency might have a crisis line and it's it's an important intermediate step before hospitalization or before getting involved with the police because um, if you call especially for either for children's and their and adults they can connect you to also the crisis lines but they um, they will get a crisis intervention team out for psychiatric it's mobile psychiatric um, outreach and they will get a team out there it might involve um, police officers might involve EMTs, but there's actual crisis teams that will go out wow, okay. and assess the situation, and it's it's so important for people to understand that because it it is an intermediate step, and the crisis team will will evaluate and see does this person need hospitalization or does this person you know need there's also something called respite care, where um, you can have um, a respite bed, and and you you do have. Um, people with you there, but it's not actual hospitalization. I see. Yeah, so it's a really valuable, valuable mm -hmm. tool. So if someone is like, you know, in the process of almost harming themselves, I can see, you know, mm -hmm. just going right to 911. I mean, if someone is right there and it's endangering the, mm -hmm. the life of a family member, but if you're still in crisis but not quite there yet, you're suggesting maybe 211 would be the intermediate They step? will get you to the crisis line number or they will transfer you there, okay. yes. There's also something within the, the state funded system called a warm line. And this is for people who, if they're, you know, feeling themselves uncomfortable and not, you know, they're, they're not, um, they're either isolated, they're, you know, they're starting to be symptomatic. The warm line, you can just talk to somebody. Oh, okay. And, and these warm lines are really um, developed for that reason. Before you know, you get into a situation where you're you're you know not feeling control, that the you can talk to somebody on the phone. And the warm line is 24 hours. It's staffed, or um, is it? Is it? Most facilities have. I'm not sure the the total hours. We might even be okay. able to find in the pamphlet in terms of the hours, but okay. they are 
a, a generous amount of hours because it could be you know that two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. You can't sleep. Right, you know you need right, right, you need to talk right, to somebody. Right. That so they do have pretty pretty good experience. Well, hold uh, through the rest of the video because we'll certainly put that information up at the end, the warm okay. line and all of the websites. So again, I would just remind people, hang tight. We'll we'll share that information. Um, I'd like to move on and and uh, can we talk about what health insurance typically uh, does and does not cover for for this issue? Sure. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think uh, Christy had spoken about whether you have private insurance or mm -hmm. if you don't, there are various state programs. Um, my personal experience was that um, we, my family had private insurance. We still continue to have private insurance. And trying to get coverage for my daughter um, became extremely difficult. I think um, the words that I heard repetitively mm -hmm. um, were, no, it doesn't meet our criteria, or she's not a danger to herself, therefore she can't receive services. Um, it became a real um, access issue to my daughter really even receiving health care. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was just such a shock to me because I'm a nurse, my ex-husband's a physician, and we thought if we can't, with the expertise we have, be able to receive services or have the private insurance companies say yes to us, what's it like for others who don't have that ability? So I think what's, what ended up happening with us was that because our private insurance didn't cover a lot of the evidence-based home services, which are the ones that are right in the community, we saw the state, which was through the Department of Children and Families, and received something called voluntary services. Um, in which the state would come in, they'd offer respite to me, they'd work directly with our family, they kept my daughter at home, and it was much less expensive than if we hadn't received those services and my daughter was put in the hospital, um, which she was. So um, one of the things I think just to sort of conclude is that um, what, what is happening is there's a cost shifting so that those who have private insurance, um, if they're being refused, then we go to the state and then the state will pay for private insured folks. And what is happening is, is that it, the money is being shifted where it mm -hmm. shouldn't be to the private sector. So do you think there's some leverage happening with private insurers that this is becoming more and more, um, you know, they're kind of being forced to recognize that this is an issue that they should insure, that it, it's a cost savings to them in the long run if they were to deal with it in the beginning? Or are you still seeing us having to rely on state funding because they're resisting um, that trend. What I mean, let's be honest. What do you yeah. think that you're seeing? I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll be honest. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> I, I testified in October before um, a, a large group um, to the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Her name is Vicki Beltry, and she's just uh, really um, wanting to find out uh, how we can ensure or hold the private insurance in industry accountable to our state laws because we've had state or Connecticut parity equity um, for mm -hmm. years. And then with the federal parity in 2008, there should be no questions as to why we can't have mental health coverage be equal. Mm -hmm. So I think the big piece that I would say is that we have the most incredible laws. We need to have ways to maintain accountability or have uh, whatever our consumer entities are to hold the private insurance accountable to those laws. Okay. Uh, so okay. that's... Well, that's great. Um, I, um, I'm kind of, uh, I tell it like it is, so I appreciate the candor. I think that's what's so important in this discussion because parents um, are dealing with what we talked about, the crisis or the emotion, um, the draining of their lives when it deals with mental Absolutely. health, and they really need to know the truth so that they can, they can get to advocate and, and, and help their family members in the most effective way. Um, Jen, maybe you could talk to us about the professionals, uh, what, what the role is for in the school system and what options they have beyond the school, not maybe just in East Hampton, but if you think of statewide uh, options maybe that they might have if, if you have a situation in, in your local school system. Sure, I can talk about what we have at the school-based level first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, all of our schools not only focus on structuring the academics for the students, but we work so much on character building. Um, all of our schools in East Hampton, and I believe Colchester as well, are positive behavior interventions and support schools. Yes. It's a wonderful Absolutely. program. And what that is, is it basically just works on promoting positive behaviors and expectations for all students. So this is not something where only students who have a need participate in. This is for the entire school-based population, and we have it from preschool all the way up to high school. 
what it is is it's teaching expected behaviors to students and really promoting them. So when you show respect, responsibility, these positive behaviors, mm -hmm. we're really encouraging them to show them often with verbal acknowledgement and praise and we, we celebrate those kind of good character building traits in all of our students. Mm -hmm. Um, within that PBIS program, there's certain levels of support too. If we're seeing that certain students need more than just an overall foundation of sort of this edge character education, we can provide further supports and interventions for them on a more personal level based on their specific areas of need. So what is it is, is it's really an early intervention program that we can kind of streamline and identify children who may need further help and support in terms of behavior which is often the most outward manifestation of some of these earlier concerns. Mm -hmm. um, I think when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that what you're also seeing right now is a lot of anxiety in kids um, and how that manifests itself. Um, you know, maybe you could explain you know, sure. how, you, how you deal with that sort of uh, initial uh, symptom of uh, what could be something uh, much larger. Sure, um, we were speaking earlier about what I'm kind of seeing in terms of trends or in working with the student population that I work with and obviously my students are very very little so most often what we see and what I'm seeing more and more is that anxiety, mm -hmm. separation anxiety from parents, stress or anxiety about just their day-to-day -day functioning within the school community, within their peer relationships um, it's been a huge influx in terms of our caseload, and I know the counseling staff in East Hampton has been speaking about it um, in great detail. Um, and it's something that we always handle on an individual basis, um, working very closely with parents, especially if it's a case of separation anxiety or parents call and say, look, you know, my child's having such a hard time coming to school. I don't know what's going on. And I'm seeing all this emotionality where there wasn't before. What can we do? Um, and that's when I said earlier that I really encourage parents to call because mm -hmm. oftentimes if you're seeing something at home and you key us in, into it, we yeah. can put extra eyes on that child and really start to see what we may not have necessarily noticed before. Well, clearly for school age kids, parental involvement is the most important factor and including that, that's, that teacher and maybe there is something going on at home and how those things manifest themselves, so that's a really good point. Um, something else that we also yeah. have in East Hampton too is we have um, a portion of the primary mental health grant. Um, and we work with what's called the Special Friend Program, which is our early intervention program as well for students in grades one through three, where they're identified through just a universal screening process. It's maybe requiring a little further social skills interventions and supports, um, and we provide that program to them. Mm -hmm. It's very play-based, very child-centered, mm -hmm. but it's also an additional way that we provide services to students oh, who may need an extra support. And like I said, that's funded through the Primary Mental Health Grant through the yeah. state. Part of the reason, you know, is there's so much information out there, and it's mm -hmm. just Try, and you know, I like to get myself, um, you know, educated as possible, so we can talk about this. And I know Greg uh, also feels the same way. So maybe um, Tom, you could talk about how the current services, how we can, um, how we can improve that, and maybe kind of highlight some things maybe we didn't get to talk about um, in the roundtable discussion that uh, you think are important. Yeah, certainly. Do you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did touch on some of those. Certainly, uh, and you talked about parity. And, and access to services and that's a huge uh, thing that NAMI is involved with among others because it is a huge issue right now. Um, certainly services within the school, some of the things that you touched mm -hmm. on, you know, that's not universal in every school system, um, but having things like maybe school-based health centers in some of the larger school systems uh, or even just, you know, a school psychologist and or a social worker in some of the smaller ones, that's a really huge thing that I think could help a lot of folks. Uh, things like supportive housing for folks that are involved with a mental health issue. You can't expect people to become, uh, enter, or I should say, enter recovery if they're living under a bridge or even uh, mm -hmm. in a homeless shelter. You know, you need stable housing for that, and it's very cost effective, and we could spend, you know, half an hour just on that. Uh, certainly reducing stigma, making it so that people aren't ashamed of these things. I mean, one in four adults is going to have a serious mental illness at some point in their life. It is much more prevalent than cancer, heart disease, diabetes, but because of the behavioral aspects of it, people feel the stigma and they don't come out of the shadows. So if we can get rid of the stigma, that would be huge. And last, but certainly not least, uh, more funding for things like crisis intervention teams, these teams that can help uh, both police departments as well as other first responders know how to deal with someone that's in crisis and, and they've been very effective in the towns that have had the training it needs to be throughout the whole state you know it's it's uh, interesting you mentioned uh, you know the stigma piece 
Um, you know, I was uh, sworn in January 9th, and you know, it's been a whirlwind ever since. And there's that um, concourse between the state capitol and the LOB, and they had put up a display. And I don't know which group had put up the display, but one of the displays, it was a photo, and it was you know large and, and blown up, and it and it had a picture of a woman on it, and the caption was, I had a heart attack last year, and everyone sent me flowers and wanted mm. to take me out to dinner, mm. and I was just diagnosed with bipolar, and nobody has called me. Right. And it really kind of struck a chord with me that, um, you know, again, that is a disease, mm -hmm. and, you know, a, an incident where, you know, it, and you talk about that, it, you know, you're so, it's so true, and, you know, so I hope that, you know, the, the discussion Discussion here today can help some of the folks at home and realize the services that they can get and that there's support there and uh, hopefully we can help break down some of those stigmas. Is there anything that we uh, haven't touched on uh, any one of you that you think is important that we talk about briefly before we wrap up? Well I think one of the things that uh, I've seen um, in Colchester both at the town and school level is that we do ensure for a variety of uh, mental illness illnesses and we are seeing, we get a lot of aggregate data, and one of the top five conditions that we have as a population of employees is depression, which a lot of people found surprising. But when you look at that and you're able to link it to some of the other conditions, you see diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension. So people's overall health, uh, when it goes into decline, will help tip the scale and actually create some of these mental illnesses. So I think as a society we have to look at the, everything that's going on with an individual mm -hmm. and see that there's, there's root causes for a lot of these things that have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good mm -hmm. point. Anybody else, Christy, did you, did you have anything you'd like to add to that? Well, on the, on the flip side of that, I think that us, if somebody is on a medication um, for, for mental illness, they can also cause many side effects and I, I think that's something the kind of overall population doesn't understand as well. You know, if somebody's falling asleep, if someone's, um, you know, if, if someone's on a medication, it can cause the diabetes, it can cause mm -hmm. the other health conditions. So it's kind of that fine line between, is it the chicken or the egg? Like mm -hmm. which, is, which is making it worse? And on average, people with mental illness die 25 years younger weight gain is a huge thing for psychiatric medications. So, you know, someone who they're dealing with having been diagnosed and then all of a sudden they're dealing with gaining 60 pounds, not 20 pounds, not 40, but these huge weight gains that all of a sudden then that changes how you feel about yourself. So, mm -hmm. it's so it is that whole kind of that whole picture that definitely. I think. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this has been very helpful to me, and I hope that it will be helpful to the constituents that, that I serve. And um, I look forward to having continuing these conversations. I'll be attending a breakfast, I think, next week for the uh, Region 2 Excellent. Mental Health, and Ooh. look forward to meeting you. So thanks so much for being here today. Thank and you. I hope you found the information here helpful. Thank you.